Hi, I'm John the Engineer, and this is the debate at the Walmer Church on the 23rd of June for the Trinity Spadina by-election. And I've included the answers of the two leading candidates, the front runners, the NDP and the Liberal, with mine. Now, I want to teach you the lesson about rhetoric versus argument. After you've listened to each answer, stop for a second and try to remember what the guy just said. Now, in the case of rhetoric, which is simply filling up space with gab that means nothing, you're not going to be able to remember what he said. And if it's argument, you will be able to remember what I said. So note the difference. How many times they wish you had this and things are so bad and they list all the bad things and how things that they want to be better and at the end of it all you end up with nothing. They simply want things to be better though they got no clue or ever tell you how. And thank you to the residents associations who organized this. And thank you to all of you for brave, braving the rain to come on out. My name is Joe Gresson, and I'm running in this campaign to, to carry on Olivia Chow's work, to stand up for progressive issues, proudly progressive issues in downtown, and to join a team, the NDP, that's taking on Stephen Harper every single day. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I was well, I grew up on Walter Road just up the street. My wife, Nina, and I, she's here. We live on Albany Avenue a few blocks over. And I've spent my life working on social and environmental justice issues at home and abroad. I'm a director with the Stephen Lewis Foundation, working on HIV and AIDS in Africa, supporting women's organizations at the front lines of the pandemic. And I've spent years living and working in West and Southern Africa. I've worked in flying First Nations reserves in Northern Ontario, Ojibwe and Cree communities, working with Frontier College on literacy. And I've worked here locally and right across this country on the environment, on protecting our water, protecting our air, and protecting our climate. You know, I have experience at local, national, and international levels. Proven experience, the type of experience I think you need in a representative in Ottawa. And let's not run in this by-election because, well, I'm concerned about the direction we're heading on the big issues, the big issues affecting us, we're heading in the wrong direction. Income inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor has been growing for 35 years. Climate change and the accelerating climate crisis is one of the defining issues of our time and the challenges facing our cities. We need an urban, progressive, a progressive agenda to deal with transit and housing, to deal with infrastructure and childcare. I'm running to stand up for progressive issues and hopefully, with your support to stand up for each and every one of you. And I look forward to the big. Thanks, guys. I'm showing just a moment to now, Mr. Turmel. Allow me. I introduce you. Oh! <laughs> this promises to be, he promised to be entertaining. This is uh, running independent as an independent, and I think he wouldn't mind if I said, Proudly and cousinly independent, Mr. John Trumell. Hi there. I am in the Guinness Book of Records for running in more elections than anyone else in history. <laughs> Count, counting the last Brant Provincial and the Brant for Mayoralty and this federal, it's my third hat trick in 82 <laughs> elections. I also hold the record for most elections lost. Now, now the Guinness Book of Records put me on the same page as Her Majesty the Queen under royalty and government. Didn't go to my head because the Americans put me on the same page as the world's biggest bagel. So anyway, why am I running? Well, how can I run and get 20 to 30 people off the street to nominate me for their member of parliament in one hour? Well, I show them my life. No, no, no. I have one of them. Let's. How many people have heard of the Let's Time Banking Green Dollar Program? Anybody? There used to be a Let's in Toronto. Anyway, I go up to people and say, look, you ever heard of Let's? No. Let's allow single poor mamas and poor people to list what lengths are available to double and triple duty babysit so that the other mamas can go out for a night off and they pay each other with one hour bills even when they're broke. 
Can you understand how a Let's might reduce suicides amongst depressed single mothers and poor people? Local employment training software. And that's how I get, I say, don't need to vote for me, just give me the chance to explain Let's to the voters. They've never voted for it before, but I want to keep trying. And 20 out of 30 people sign and nominate me for parliament in one hour off the streets because it ain't the quality of the candidate, it's the quality of the program. And I'm the only engineer who's got my program coded versus English. Okay, why this is serious? Well, you've been fooled for the last three years. Since Fukushima, remember Japan when it blew all that fallout into the sky? And three days before the plume hit BC, the Harper government turned off the fallout detectors. Didn't want to worry you. Didn't want you to stay home from work. And baby deaths in BC tripled. I did the math. I'll bet on it. Oh, by the way, anybody ever watch Rounders, the famous Holden game? Well, I was the teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics and gambling course at Carleton for four years. If you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. Remember Matt Damon at the Taj Mahal saying, we don't play together, but when was the last time you saw one piranha eat another? Well, I was known as the professor at that Taj Mahal, the Wizard of Oz, the great white shark amongst the piranha. So what am I doing here? I want to show you how to quit getting the bite taken out of you by the loan sharks by running your own interest-free chips, which is what I'll talk about for the rest of the night. Mr. Adam Thank you. Uh, I was in, in the conference this, this fall and there was a guy running for a party called the Rents Too Damn High Party. You, you might want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just as much fun. Not so before we start, I wanted uh, just to uh, inform the community that we've had a very bad decision on the Old Needs Day. We've all been working together to stop this 25-story student residence at college in Spadina. Unfortunately, the Old Needs Day this once again. Uh, I, I feel as an obligation as Airport City Council to pass that on. Uh, the fight for college street, the fight for better planning in the city continues. Uh, and so with that bad news, I'll try to launch a campaign platform that uh, hopefully makes you smile. We need stronger cities. Part of it is a planning conversation, but a lot of it has to do with how we deal with housing. And student housing is part of that. But it also has to do with transit. It also has to do with our water infrastructure. I'll get to that talk about the environment. We have significant challenges with the way we manage water and the way water consumes electricity in Toronto. And federal infrastructure money that's absent in that funnel is hurting all of us. And the final issue that no one talks about as part of the national urban strategy is culture. Culture is a fundamental part of any civic infrastructure. Arts and the arts and culture create cities, and cities are the place where the arts and culture actually come into play. And urban agendas that ignore that and put culture off to the side miss a critical part of city. But the fundamental thing we need, and that the program that we haven't had, and the reason that I got into journalism, and the reason I left journalism to come to City Hall and come to this neighborhood to represent this community for eight years uh, down in City Hall, is the issue of housing. We have not had a national housing program in this country literally since the mid 80s. All governments have failed. It doesn't matter whether it's the NDP at Queen's Park, it doesn't matter if it's the Liberals in Ottawa, it doesn't matter if it's the Conservatives who started most the housing cuts in Brown and Mulroney. Housing has been taken away from this city and other cities right across the country, and that needs to change. And the reason I've joined the Liberal Party, and the reason I'm running in this campaign, is to, yes, to bring the national urban agenda to a focus on the national prominence and to make cities right across this country stronger. But everybody talks about transit. Housing is talked about afterwards. For me, housing is where you start. Housing is the one issue that drives savings into the federal health care budget, savings in the average First Nations communities, and allow them to tackle some of their issues. Housing fixes some of the challenges students and families have sending their kids off to university. Housing, housing, housing. It's got to change. And so I'm changing the campaign platform uh, that, that, uh, that uh, I am seeking to represent here by, by, by joining the Federal Liberal Party. I'm changing the way we talk about cities and we talk about housing by campaigning for a seat in Ottawa. And I need your support to make that change happen, not just in this riding, not just in the city, but across the country. When you build stronger neighborhoods, you do build stronger cities. And when you build stronger cities, you get a stronger country. But you don't do it if you don't stand up and fight for it. Thank you.
Okay, given the absence of a conservative candidate, I'd yes, um, right in reference to what you started to say, uh, the conservative candidate was invited but declined. Which of you is best qualified and most passionate about bringing scientific thinking back into the government? In five, in the last five years, the Stephen Harper government has fired 2,000 scientists. And when they're not firing scientists, they're muzzling the ones we have. And it's not just ignoring scientists in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans or the Ministry of Environment, it's also cutting the long-form census. We have no idea who lives in the new buildings that are being built down south because we don't ask them anymore. We have a conservative government that does politically based fact making as opposed to fact based policy making. That's what we need in this country. We need evidence based decision making. When I look at climate change, I look to the experts. When I look at building a national transit strategy for stable, predictable, and permanent funding and what to go where, I look to the experts. That's the commitment of the NDP. That's the commitment of me. Thank you. If you YouTube for student vote Termel, you'll find my explanation to the grade fours about how I got a grade 17 in science, systems engineering, 98 percentile math, 100 percent physics, and why, of course, would they think that's important? Well, here's your big chance to actually send someone to Parliament who knows something about science. So, it isn't my job, it's your job. And you finally got a chance to vote for a guy with a science degree. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Mr. Bernard. I think the good news for voters in this part of the city, in this part of the country, is that between the Greens and the NDP and the Liberals, uh, we all have a great deal of faith in science and, and intellectual pursuits that give us uh, facts to base policy rather than uh, working it the other way around. Uh, and so, the long-form census, which in particular hurts Toronto because we have been woefully undercounted and deliberately, there was a lawsuit this week, working its way through the courts, hurts us when we get the capital funding to deal with some of the challenges we have, especially on transit and housing. The issue that, 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 uh, that hasn't been addressed is the DuPont study. One of the things that we've been working very hard at in this part of the city is changing the way we do employment lines. We're not going to get another auto industry landing in, in, at the corner of Christie and DuPont. What we need to do is find the micro projects that build small economies and grow them into medium sized economies, but do it in a way that's compatible with local residential areas. This is the policy we pursue at City Hall. It's one that the federal government can accelerate by supporting the way the city build themselves with better infrastructure funding. So, uh, what I was going to say was there's no conservative at the table, which says something about the rather anti conservative sentiment of this riding. So, I'd like to know what each of you will do to get rid of Stephen Harper after the next election. What a dilemma! How to get rid of Harper? Show my knife. No, no, no. <laughs> look, look, I wasn't kidding when I said that the Environment Canada turned off the nuclear fallout detectors on March 25th, 2011. That had to come from the top. Baby deaths in BC tripled. Do you understand what Harper did? I mean, you guys think you want to get rid of him. I'm going to put him in jail. Okay? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, hey, we've been sucking up fallout for three years, and he hasn't warned you suckers about it. I have. Look at my YouTube videos, Cure All Fast, 18 week fast to kill the cancers, to show you how to do it, because I didn't like three years worth of sucking up fallout. Maybe you ought to wise up and blame the right guy, too. Thank you. Mr. Hart, you're a hard actor for him, right? <laughs> I haven't dealt with Ralph Ford for four years. Stephen Hart almost seems like a ball of the same league. He's, like, he's uh, presenting challenges that are much more serious and, and unfortunately um, have, has, has had a run of it that uh, has, has done some damage to this country, to our country's reputation internationally, and he does have to be dealt with. I'm not going to sit here and promise you a coalition government anymore than I can promise you a majority of liberal government. Any politician that tells you how they're going to construct the next parliament before it's elected uh, is, is getting a little ahead of the, the, the dynamic. Look, I've been working at City Hall for eight years. I have found a way to collaborate with people, regardless of the geographic position they may occupy in the city, regardless of the ideological position of the party they belong to. When it comes to building shelters for youth, I work with David Shiner. When it came to stopping the island airport, I worked with my waterfront colleagues, Pam McConnell and Mike Lee. When it came to dealing with the casino, we put together a 
coalition right across the country that transformed the way we do politics in Toronto. Collaboration happens, collegiality happens, and it must be what defines being elected to Ottawa, but you can't cancel the coalition until you know who you're negotiating with. Snowball Casino, I want one. This is one of the most important questions you need to think about in this election. Harper must go. In the future, that means we need proportional representation to make sure that every single vote counts. Okay. The NDP supports proportional representation. The Liberals are opposed. But that's in the future. Right now, we need to work together to defeat Stephen Harper and form a progressive government. We tried it in 2008, 2009, we formed the coalition with the Liberals. Michael Ignati became the leader, tore it up and said, only a Liberal government. Six years later, Harper is still in power, and Tom Mulcair has said, we will work with the other parties to defeat Stephen Harper and form a progressive government. And Justin Trudeau has said, and I quote, I will not work in coalition. That's a quote. This is a key difference. My objective is, and Tom Walker's objective is defeating Stephen Harper. It's more than party politics. They elect us to work together and get results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I just want to know how we're going to diversify, diversify our global economic uh, dependence on the states so that we stop being dependent on them. Okay, so the answer is to do more economy at home so we don't need to export so much. Now, why can't we buy everything we produce? Everybody borrows the principal, pays to produce the goods, and they all got to raise the price to get back the principal plus the interest, P plus I. But guess what? We only got P, the principal. We can't pay P plus I. Something always remains unsold, and we must get into the export game with the rest of the world. But if we used a local employment trading system interest-free poker chip for our collateral, we could do lots of local economy at home and only export excess we need. So while you use bank money at usury, you have to export and play that game. But when you run your own chips without usury, you don't have to anymore. We've got enough money in the home market to buy everything we produce. Mr. Vaughn, diversifying trade is critically important. And you do that with the trade agreements that do two things. One, they, they create reciprocal uh, opportunities for the countries that are signing them. But the second thing is, is that you make sure that the behavior of Canadian corporations is consistent with the laws and rules and regulations at home, so you don't end up with some of the challenges that mining companies have created in Latin America. But the second thing is you take a look at situations uh, like Asia and the Pacific Rim opportunities that present themselves. You must also make sure that people have the same rights as dollars. And for that, you need to make sure that the flow of, of goods and services includes a just flow of people as well. And we have had in, in the policies, and you can see with the temporary workers program, we have had policies which punish individuals while purporting to, to support and, and, and underpin the economy. And we have been in a very precarious position because of that. We have an over-dependence on the United States, and we need to rethink some of those issues. But you don't do it in an antagonistic position to work towards the trade partners. You do it through cooperation, collaboration with them, and you make sure that you advance Canada's interests while also making sure you protect your interests at home, including the right to source locally. Thank you. I think climate change is one of the defining issues of our time. 60, 70 years from now, what are we going to tell our kids? That we ignored the science and the signs of climate change because it would help us win election. That's not good enough. Here's what the NDP would do. First, we would put a price on carbon for cap and trade and invest the revenues in a green energy economy for the transition. Second, we would stop the $1.2 billion that go to subsidize big oil in this country, which was $8.3 billion over nine years by the liberals. We would stop those subsidies and invest it in green technology. We would say no to the Keystone Oil Sands Pipeline, which would accelerate the price of oil. Here are my 15 seconds coming on three principles. Respect for First Nations, with an eye to long-term prosperity, and always, absolutely always, an eye to sustainability. Thank you very much. Our current debt acquisition model 
basically makes it impossible for us to pay back our old loans unless we borrow new loans. So the question is, what would your party do to reform the economic model so we don't continue to acquire debts and kick the can down the road, so to speak, until we eventually either, you know, declare bankruptcy or have the IMF contingency loan, which, you know, we're soon going to be uh, downgraded by the S&P. So Thank how you. How would you reform the economic model? Mr. Jarnell, you are the number one on this one. Okay, I explained to the kids when I ran for Bradford Mayor that the Let's program would allow me to pay them with bus tickets to shovel the snow and help old people have less heart attacks, clean the park, stuff like that. I explained to the kids how the Let's program would allow people to work for the provinces and they get paid with tickets they could use for hydro, taxes, medical, and licenses. A lot better than bus tickets, but harder for adults to understand. Kids get tickets right away. I could do the same with the Bank of Canada, run a PayPal, log on, not MasterCard, thousand hours of labor, settle all your interest bearing debts, all payments go against principal, someday you're out of debt. So it's only the interest causing the problems, and the lead software is the only interest-free software you've ever heard of before, and you never voted for before, and you're probably not going to get it now either. <laughs> because they never got it! Well, the Liberals have a very um, proud record of balancing the budget and getting the country's finances into a position um, that, that put us in service, and, and the Tories have scorned that, and it put us into a very difficult spot. Those decisions they bought us, they were tough, but when the country started to grow again, and when those cuts um, had balanced the most, what you saw then was a strategic reinvestment in the economy, in housing, in daycare, the whole series of issues that allowed us to build a good, strong country that started to deal with some of the challenges that they had to deliver to us. That's a liberal policy. Good, prudent fiscal management that gets us out of debt, but at the same time, what you get when there are surpluses is a substantial and a robust investment in cities, in social programs, in some of the injustices of the past. I just want to quickly you address one issue that was raised by one of my colleagues here, and that's the, 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 the issue of Montclair. He has said he wants to be a partner to him. That's not what you just said, Mr. Gresson. Thank you. Mr. Gresson. Thank you. You know, listen, for my generation's entire life, we've been told that the problem is the deficit, and therefore the solution under liberal and conservative governments was to cut services and jobs. Or we've been told that the problem is taxes, and therefore the solution is to cut taxes. Those are not the problems. Taxing and spending is the role and function of a government, any government. Tax is not a four-letter word. What we need to do in this country is invest again. Invest in a strong economy by dealing with the urgent issues affecting our cities, like child care and housing and transit. Investing in a green energy economy to drive the future for the next generation. What we need to do when we talk about the economy is talk about jobs. Jobs. Good, decent, well-paying jobs. That will, that's what creates a strong economy. As an NDP government, we would take on youth unemployment, we would deal with the national transit strategy to invest, and we would invest in green energy. Thanks. Um, just in light of all of the undercover investigations that have been coming out with um, showing just the horrendous neglect and abuse on factory farms in Canada, I'm just wondering what uh, the candidates and, uh, and your parties, um, what initiatives you might have to address it seems to be uh, culture of cruelty right now. The agricultural industries. Mike? The agricultural industries are an industry, and they need to be dealt with uh, and regulated in a process that's not dissimilar to, to the oil industry or, or the auto industry. They need to be regulated, not just on the cruelty issue, but as a journalist, I covered Walkerton, and I saw what happens firsthand when, when you have poor environmental performance, combined with poor public services and the cuts that others have talked about. And so changing the, the, the way we do government is a fundamental way to get at some of these issues. Not to stake out ideological positions and then figure out the process. Not to choose a pipeline and then do the consultation. And not to okay processes and then figure out what the mistakes are. You have to do what we did in Ward 20, what I did in the City Hall for eight years. You have to fundamentally rethink government process. You have to bring stakeholders to the table, all of them, not just some of them. Then you have to work together for the 
best outcome for the country, which includes producing food, but also means producing it safely for consumption, but also for the industrial impacts that it has. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a really important question. Let me address it directly. And I've spent some time on my, I've served on the board of the Stop Community Food Center, working on farm to table initiatives here, as well as at the Everdale Environmental Center. I was a future farmer intern once, years ago. We need to do a couple things. We need to discourage model prepper. We need to do better labeling, labeling of GMOs. My goodness, let's get to it. We need to fund the National Farm Animal Care Council properly and sustainably. And the most important thing, and I alluded to this off the top, is we need to become a leader in environmentally sustainable food production. That's what we need to do. That's why I have to Thank you. Yes, we care and we need more. Are any solutions? No. As long as small farmers don't have a chance in the financial competition for loans, they can't compete with the big boys. Never will. And it happens to be the cheapest way to create chickens this way, torture them, mass production, big profits. Little farmers can't do that. But as soon as they got an interest-free loan at the Bank of Canada, and now they can get their seed and sell it and pay off later, all our problems are over. So we're back to fixing interest-free money as the only solution, despite what they really want it, I know. Something really has to be done, quickly. They're all upset. It's terrible. But they all got no way to pay for any reform except me. So, back to the Let's program. As for climate change and carbon tax, can they still be fooled by the trick they used to hide the decline? CO2 spike, temperature change in 18 years, and these clouds are talking about global warming? Oh no, they changed the climate change. It ain't temperature degrees no more. It's climbs. What is a climb? <laughs> yes. Units of climate change are what? You're done. <laughs> We're going to take another question from this side now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. My question is coming from a place of being a former combat medic for 10 years in the Canadian Forces, a veteran who deals every single day with the hell of PTSD, one who is actually lucky enough to still be here rather than my brothers and sisters who have taken their own lives or who are still fighting just to get basic benefits. My question is, do you believe in a social obligation between Canada and our soldiers? How do you understand that obligation to exist? And what would you and your parties do to restore that obligation, the very obligation that the Harper government has said does not exist? Mr. Cressy. Yes. Thanks, Gus. Thank you for the question. And it speaks to two really important issues for me. The first is how we honor service, service of all kinds. And the second is how we talk about mental health. And I thank you for raising that. On service, the Conservative government likes to pretend that it takes care of our veterans, and it does not. It's closing veteran services offices. You know this. We would open them back up. We need a real veterans charter in this country. That's one of the things we've talked about in our party, is a veterans charter to look at issues around pension support, to look at PTSD support. And you know what? The thing with PTSD support, it's not like you just give keep somebody counseling once. If you're living with a mental illness, you need counseling every week. Every single week. That's how we care for each other better. The role of a government and a society is to care for each other and to make sure we provide the services and the support for those who serve so that we do that. Thank you. 1967, Canada's Centennial, July 1st, Parliament Hill. Calvin Highlanders of Ottawa, Queen's Honor Guard. And I was wearing a kilt that day. I was there. So, look, Great, man. I want to give every sick person an interest-free credit card so they have maximum access to everything they need, not just you guys. I want to give every cripple, every poor person the same thing. You know what I mean? Nothing special. You don't need nothing special. You just need support when you're down, and hopefully you can put it back later when you're up. And that's right on the Bible. Paul Corinthians 2, chapter 8, 14. Your abundance should at the present time be a supply for their want, so theirs can later be a supply for your want. 
And in that way, he who gathers much doesn't have too much, and he who gathers little doesn't have too little, and that's what Lex does. It shares out the abundance to the guys who are down until you're up and sharing it back. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the service. I think I join my colleagues here. The behavior of the, the federal government of Stephen Harper has been shameful. Um, it's, it's been embarrassing. I, I was talking to an Afghan veteran who has been working on my campaign about this very issue and told about a program we were developing at City Hall and hadn't quite found the, the, the way to package it to bring it to senior levels of government yet around post traumatic stress disorder. What we know about it is that it works um, in different ways with different people and the best way out of it is as a group working together, peer counseling, on peer counseling. We also know that there are prior neighborhoods in Toronto where young people and families are dealing with exactly the same symptoms but it's not recognized because it's diagnosed only overseas and not in our own communities with gunfire and violence is a significant issue. So part of what we want to do is put together veterans and these young people and build new programs that allow veterans to make another contribution to Canada. They've made great ones so far, they can make better ones still in this particular area because they have expertise, but they also come from those communities. This is the kind of thinking that needs to change up in Ottawa. We have to take what's working locally, amplify and accelerate it, and you are part of the solution. I got an email from you, Mr. Vaughn, um, where you essentially Implied that Mr. Cressy was a hypocrite because a member of his party supported pipelines out in Alberta. I agree 100%. There are lots of clean energies out there. She just can't afford them. Okay? There's no money. There's no money for clean. Dirty's cheaper. And we've only got enough money for dirty cheaper. She ain't got more money for cleaner. I do. Now, when you got enough money, you can buy cleaner. But right now, as long as you're always paying the top of your budget and debt service to the banks, right. you're never going to have enough money for clean energy. But she's right. Everything she wants, we should have, except she ain't got no money. And I do. So, vote for her. She wants it. <laughs> <laughs> says no to pipelines. The trouble with that is that puts rail in play, and rail in the north end of this riding is a significant risk to all of us who live here. The Lake McKenna trains will be The trains that have derailed the Mississauga rolled through the DuPont corridor, and I moved the motions of council to regulate that rail corridor again because we've lost that control with our group in Ottawa. The reason I call that the NEP position is the NEP supports Canada East. The Canada East will change oil production from the west by transporting oil from 800,000 barrels plus a day to 1.1 billion, million barrels a day. And Canada East would increase by about 25% the oil requirements coming out of the tar sands. In fact, the NDP candidate in the tar sands has said, and I quote, it's not just a job, the world benefits from what Mother Nature has given us to work with. When Joe Cressy spoke against tar sands and oil sands production, he was corrected by his leader. What the Liberals stand for is very simply this, a process. We don't choose an oil pipeline and then say, let's get it approved. What we talk about is a better environment, regulatory process that builds better projects, regulates them better, cleans up effectively with our accidents, and more importantly than that, trust communities, as Willie knows, who will not put a pipeline if First Nations and Aboriginal communities are not on the table. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Climate change is a defining issue, and pipelines are That's why our party has said no to Northern Gateway, no to Keystone, and no to line up. We evaluate resource development and pipelines on the basis of the following conditions so that it must be done sustainably in partnership with First Nations and with an eye to long term prosperity. And Adam, I need to fact check you there. It is not correct to say that we support Energy East. In fact, we have not supported the Energy East pipeline. Rather, we have said we will endorse pipelines if they meet those conditions. The Liberals have supported pipelines without conditions. The Liberal Party of Canada supports Energy East, supports Keystone, and supports the reversal of Line 9 without any conditions. Justin Trudeau went to Washington and said that Stephen Harper wasn't doing enough to lobby for Keystone. In this election, there is an environmental choice, and it's the NDP. Continuation to that question, um, as a pro-science progressives who are no doubt aware the climate's destabilization is imminent and threatening. <laughs> and the burning the tar sands is the most irresponsible thing Canada can do in this regard. Harper's vision for Canada is tar sands and pipelines. What is your party going to do to de-implement Harper's disastrous plan of dirt?
dirty energy and carbon pollution rather than providing Canadians with an alternative? Why won't your party say no taxes, no pipelines as the people of Canada want? They're going to tax you and give you some back. Believe that one? Look, temperature hasn't risen in 18 years. CO2 has gone up. Now, if you want to make something out of that, I'm trying to tell you they used a trick to hide the decline in the data. Hey, I got a science degree. You use the word science, go get some. Temperature ain't changed, lady, and I ain't paying no carbon tax to fight some imaginary threat. You know money where the rubber is. I said temperature ain't rising, it ain't risen in 18 years, and I ain't paying no carbon tax for your imaginary threat. Hang on. There's a bit of theater going on here. It's cool, I love it. Everything's very good. Can we have somebody else follow him for a while? <laughs> WC Field said, never follow kids and dogs. Climate change has happened, and we've been dealing with it in City Hall for the last eight years. One of the reasons I'm running is that we have got to start to deal with it in open centers. The worst machine we've ever built is the city. We generate more greenhouse gas here than anywhere else. And we can talk about which pipeline is better and which pipeline goes through a better process to we're in the face. But if we don't stop greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to be in big trouble. Oh, yeah. And so the issue is this. On housing, on transit, on water infrastructure in particular, the largest consumer of electricity in Toronto is our leaky water system. Until we build better cities, smarter cities, cities that house people more environmentally soundly, that have better transit systems, that are maintained better, that are operating with subsidies. Until we get our water situation, both the management of the storm surges, plus just the daily drinking water we manage. Until we get that under control, we will fail as a country to deal with this issue. The tar sands challenge us all. But the urban agenda needs to solve this problem. It's why I'm running, it's what I did at City Hall, and it's the issue that will define whether or not we survive the next century. No change. So, the oil sands are the largest contributor of emissions in this country. Can you please be quiet, John? Sorry. Oil sands are the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, and Canada is now the eighth largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Eighth largest. So here's what we think we need to do. We need an 80% reduction on greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in this country. If we don't do that, global temperatures will rise full above 2 degrees Celsius, and that's the breaking point. So we need an 80% reduction. In order to do that, we need to put a price on carbon. And we support a cap and trade system because it provides certainty about the amount of emissions that are created, because that's what we're talking about here, is emissions. And we will invest the revenues from the energy trade system into green tech. It makes sense. What we'll also do is stop the subsidies to big oil, $1.4 billion a year under the Conservatives right now. It was $8.3 billion under the Liberals over a number of years. And in this violation, as part of this, we will say no to the Keystone Pipeline because it's real and Obama hasn't approved it yet. We shouldn't let him. Thank you very much. <laughs> CO2 and water vapor are not pollutants. They are both essential to agriculture and to all life on Earth. Trading carbon credits and capital trading contribute nothing to the economy. It's not science. It's propaganda by politicians to support plans for a global taxes by a global government with no accountability to those in which it's to tax and control. On a lighter note, I would tell you, I have heard that the um, temperature on Mars has gone up, and I can assure you there's no Martians driving SUVs up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're at the end. If you're elected, will you introduce a private member's bill to make mandatory voting a 
the law in Canada? Absolutely not. how the global warming hoaxers work. The guy said, I want to hear from number one and three and five, the guys who agree with me. I don't want to hear from two and four, the lady from Christian Heritage who said that it's basically a natural gas, CO2, doesn't cause any problems, and me who keeps pointing out the temperature hasn't changed. But if he could manage to get us excluded, he'd be able to say, we have consensus that most of the candidates agree there's global warming and that's exactly how they did it with the i with the ipcc same way they simply didn't even look at the people who were against and counted only the people who were for and when 97 percent of us agree now 98 now 99 we agree temperatures rising 
even if it hasn't in the last 18 years. Global warming cheating, that's how they do it. It's because the federal environmental process is being cut to the point of being non-existent. And one of the things that has to change in Ottawa is we need a ministry of the environment that protects the ministry, it doesn't protect uh, the, the corporations that cause much of the trouble. The issue on, on, on climate change and how to deal with some of these issues is fundamental. We have got to stop generating greenhouse gas. Prior, carbon pricing is part of the solution. Cutting uh, the, 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 the way in which uh, we use gas, fossil fuels, electricity, and urban centers is also a fundamental part of that. Airports are, should be included in that calculation. When you build smarter cities, when you increase and improve the standards of housing that you build, when you do what we did at City Hall, a program that I had to kickstart again after Ford killed it on the Tower Renewal Program, and you put these buildings back into the environmental contributors instead of detractors, and all of a sudden building smarter cities and cutting greenhouse gas. When you do it with, with, with transit, when you talk about state of the repair of transit, you aren't sending dirty buses up and down the road, but sending clean buses up and down the road, you also start to have an impact. But fundamentally, the issue is water in this city. And if we don't get a handle on water infrastructure, we will use so much electricity and generate so much in terms of greenhouse gas that we will never catch up. It will also pollute the water system. Building smarter cities is why the C40 initiative is so important. It's why I disagree with you, Mr. Pressing. It is not, the, 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 the is not the single largest. Thank you. Cities are the single largest contributor to greenhouse gas. That's the single largest project. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Cressy. I mean, you can probably tell I care a lot about the environment. It was about eight years ago, seven years ago, I don't know, I was escorted out of Parliament for calling on Stephen Harper to take action on climate change. I'm running to get back here. And I'm running because on environmental assessment, for example, so Stephen Harper got it to these firing scientists, but it's more than just restoring environmental assessment. You touched on an important part, it's strengthening. And you strengthen environmental assessment by not just bringing it back, but looking at the impact on downstream communities, First Nations communities in particular, but also looking at the impact on climate change, as you alluded to there. And so when you talk about the airports as part of that, let's talk about it. Our party, the NDP, all 100 members of our caucus are opposed to jets, are opposed to island expansion, every single member of our caucus. And more than that, we support dissolving the Toronto Port Authority, this unelected, undemocratic body, and giving control of the Port back to the city of Toronto. Thank you so much. Well, I noticed our low tech, our low tech global warming hoaxer doesn't want to hear from me because I'll flash my hundred bucks in cash in his face, say put your money where your mouth is, and when he backs down I go flash the cash, buy my trash, sir. I thought I told you climate hasn't changed in 18 years and I'm ready to bet. And you come up here with these three doofuses who promise you a carbon tax? Why? You people believe the temperature's been rising, you've been freezing your butts off for five years. What a bunch of morons you are! And you want to vote for a carbon tax? These three are promising you a carbon tax when temperature ain't gone up. And Chicken Little turned his back because he's too scared of a real science graduate to look me in the face. Flash the cash, buy my tracks. You may be a penis, sir. Go back to high school. Turn out you're done. When you sit down, you're done. <laughs> Let's try another question. On this side. Can I ask all of the candidates for their plan in respect of housing and what their parties record federal records suggest they actually be able to achieve their plan? How do we, Mr. Cressy, you start. Thank you. We have 1.5 million households in need of affordable and supportive housing right now in this country. It's shameful. We need to do two specific things. The first thing we need to do is protect the existing housing stock we have. There are 200,000 units coming up on their lease and their support from the federal government. We need to make sure that those are protected, but we need to do more than that. We need to invest and build, not just affordable housing, but supportive and cooperative housing. We need to build housing again. Now, there's a difference between Adam and Adams. Adam's done great work as a city councilor. I voted for because he's done good work on us, but his party has not. The Liberal Party cut the National Housing Program. The fact that we have 1.5 million households in need of housing is because they cut it. 
The last time we got housing investments was because Jack Layton negotiated $1.6 billion out of Colorado's budget. If you want housing, you vote for the party that stands up for housing and always has, and that's the NDP. You may be homeless, but you have a right to a home. Makes you feel better, right? Look, imagine that as fast as industry builds new housing, Casino Turnout pays them with new chips. If you want to live in that housing, you got to get some of the chips from the guys who built the houses. And then, no interest, but you got to pay the house as fast as it depreciates. Now, I know that's hard. Most people don't get it. But that's how interest-free financing would work. As fast as industry builds new collateral, the cashier gives them new chips. And as fast as the collateral is consumed, the people who consume it have to put it back. Now, how can you choose? We're all in favor of more affordable housing. Every one of us. Really? No? They've all said they want more affordable housing, right? We're all the same. I got the way of paying for it. I'm the only guy with the Let's program that can pay the workers yes. to build you your housing. But if you vote for them, you'll have the right to it. Thank you. Mr. Bond. Way to go, John. Thank you. Housing is why I'm on this stage. There is no issue more important than the future of this city and this country than housing. That's what I've been mean, working at eight years at City Hall. So the reason I've joined local parties, the reason I'm going to Ottawa, to build housing. The housing tax didn't start with the federal government. They started with Brian and Ronnie. They were continued by the NDP government in Queen's Park. The worst land that ran Ontario housing into the ground from Libya to Mike Paris land was completely destroyed. We have got to change this. The last poll market budget put $1.8 billion on the table for 10 years. Jack Layton and the NDP, to their credit, negotiated it up to $2.4 billion. It shows that we can collaborate and work together when an issue is critical, and it was critical. And I was proud to be a journalist pushing that issue up the hill. In the war that I've represented, Trey Spadina, we have 12 different housing programs underway right now without any support for any level of government. Housing for students, housing for people with disabilities, housing for people, the faculty, for workers, supportive housing, all kinds. <coughs> Alexander Park is going through a major revitalization. 250 down is next. There is no counselor, there is no politician in this country who's worked harder than their work and cares more about this issue. It's why we have why we need to support why this election is critical right now is we can build a national bank and a liberal program right across the country. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for coming out. Um, my question is uh, based on an idea that uh, David Miller came up with years ago, and that is that the federal government should leave a portion of their uh, uh, federally collected sales tax, the GST as it was called all the time. Well, I don't care how they tax me, I care how they waste it. I'll pay my tax for army and police to handle strife. I'll pay my tax for doctors and nurses who protect my life. I'll pay my tax for all engaged repairing road and sewer. I'll pay my tax for social servants helping out the poor. I'll even pay my tax for bureaucrats with no regret. <laughs> I only object to paying tax for interest on debt. Yes. I don't mind paying tax for human time at useful toil, but charging me for money's time will always make me boil. So, I'm not in favor of sales tax or against it, income tax or against it, but I think they're stupid taxes because they need a lot of account, need a lot of receipts, got to keep up your transaction. I'd rather pay an asset tax once a year, count up what I got, chip in 5%. That way we don't need all these Receipts and accountants <laughs> and all that other kind of stuff that we get to enjoy every Thank day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually started in this city with a conversation with Jane Jacobs, people like my father, and the last one. But it also included someone called Glenn Murray, who were in Winnipeg at the time, who hosted the first big city mayor's conference. And the Liberal Party responded, and Paul Martin and responded with the gas tax, amongst many other measures, as part of the way housing started to get rebuilt again. In fact, he quit the Gretchen Cabinet get that program going and become the next Prime Minister. I understand this issue because as a journalist, I covered it, as a city hall representative, I fought for it, and going to Ottawa is critical to making this thing happen. But what we need to avoid are prescriptive programs that come out of 
model. But the Liberal Party's position is very clear. What percent of GDP will be assigned to federal infrastructure for federal infrastructure funding directly to municipalities, but the municipalities will choose what they spend it on. Housing needs in Vancouver are about supportive housing for addiction and mental health. Housing needs in Winnipeg are rehabilitation of existing housing stock because they have vacancies. In Edmonton, they need rental stock because they have employment growth outstripping housing production. In Toronto, it's almost all of the above. We have to change the way we fund cities. It's why I joined the Liberal Party. Housing is a critical component. Flexibility is the experience you get when you work at City Hall and understand how to plug federal dollars into budgets to accelerate and amplify results immediately. But the Liberal Party is the only party who put the real money and a real figure on the table to get that job done. Thank you very much. There's a, there's a stat I love, which is more people ride the TTC every day than live in nine provinces or territories. We're an urban country now. The face of Canada is an urban face. It's Mississauga and Toronto, it's Vancouver and Montreal, it's Halifax and Winnipeg. It's an urban country. And cities receive only eight cents back on every tax dollar they generate. And we're generating 60% of the wealth in this country. That fiscal imbalance needs to be addressed if we're going to be able to deal with the urgent pressing needs we've talked about here today. Transit and housing, infrastructure and childcare. We can't do that without it. So we have a couple specific things we've said at the NDP we'll look at. The first is actually the corporate tax rate. It's 15%. It used to be 29. It's among the lowest in the Western world. It's unacceptable. It should be raised. Corporate tax payments. We're losing between 5.8 and $8 billion a year in tax havens. We'll look at that. We'll also look at an additional cent off the gas tax to fund cities beyond making the case for the federal government to invest in cities. Thank you. Thank you. Time for another question. We will come over to this side. Yeah, I live in an apartment here in the annex, and some people at the far end of the hall in their apartment start smoking marijuana. The smell was so strong, it came all the way down the hall into my apartment. And I got a terrible headache, and I never get headaches. I phoned the police and was stopped. What would I do if marijuana is legalized, as is proposed by Mr. Trudeau? Well, you know, back in 2006, University of Saskatchewan found that marijuana grows new brain cells, which is why it's good for Alzheimer's and dementia. So, sir, breathe in deep, it'll do you good. <laughs> now, if you Google for John Turnell and marijuana, you'll find that I'm leading 300 patients in federal court right now to repeal the marijuana laws. Now, I'm not talking about smoking the bud to laugh a little bit, laughing grass. I'm talking about needing the juice and the oil to fight the Fukushima cancers we're all going to be getting real soon. Notice how a lot of your old friends get cancer and they're gone in two months. Or little kids are gone. That's the Fukushima fallout they didn't tell you about. But marijuana oil and juice, next to fasting, go see my YouTube video, Cure All Fast, because fasting starves the cancer and it doesn't starve the healthy cells. The point is, we got to repeal the marijuana laws and get the juice and the oil or we ain't going to survive without it. Mr. One of the funny things about running for the Liberal Party is the conservative attack hats constantly focusing on marijuana. You get a lot of very interesting canvases at the doorstep. And I'm sometimes worried that they won't remember to vote for us, but uh, if you know the site, uh, it's, it's, it's an important issue. And the war on drugs has not produced anything other than misery. It's wasted a lot of money. The mandatory minimum sentence that some parties have proposed are not good ways to deal with, with the issues that confront us. We have got to deal with drugs as a health care issue, and a health care issue first and foremost, and that would be the way that we start to turn around and deal with some of the issues that you present. What you talked about is a public health issue. When we regulate tobacco, and we, and we legalize it, and we bring it into the public sphere, and we also create resources of it to facilitate that public health conversation, issues like yours can be addressed. They can be addressed when they're done best at the local level, and part of the strategy around dealing with crime and dealing with antisocial behavior to once again invest in cities and allow public health to determine how to make your life better, but also make better the life of the person consuming the marijuana, which when at risk of arrest, at risk of, of being poisoned by the chemicals that sometimes place this drug, is the issue. We need to deal with drugs as a health care issue. And that's why the Liberal Party's taken the position to stay Thank you. Mr. President, thank you, and thanks for the question. 
Um, well, on the table, I have smoked pot in the past, but it's not my, I don't like it that much, so it's not for me. Just, although I thought Jack Layton had a better line, which was, I inhaled, but I never exhaled. <laughs> but it's, it's not for me. But I will tell you, in our party, the NDP has consistently worked to decriminalize marijuana. That's our point of view, and when we come at it from that lens because we don't think the war on drugs is working, it's not. I'm firmly opposed to mandatory minimums. They don't work. They don't work south of the border, and Harper's mandatory minimums, which the Liberal Party voted for, don't work either. And I approach this from a health promotion of the harm reduction point of view, and that's why we support decriminalization. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health, many of you know it well, it's right here in Toronto, has said that a decriminalization approach would be best served for health promotion and harm reduction. And that's why our party supports that approach. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, Alan, for talking about public health. Green. Okay, in Argentina, when the bank, when the government was broke and they couldn't afford to provide the services you wanted, the union said, you're not laying anybody off anymore. You can't bring your million dollar bond to a bank to get bills to pay us. We'll take ten dollar bonds in our paycheck as long as we can use them for hydro, taxes, medical and licenses. So the Argentine government's provincial were forced to pay all their unions and government employees with small denomination provincial bonds you could use for Ontario Hydro, Ontario Medical, licenses. My point is as fast as they build new hospitals and they're paid with new chips. You can earn those chips to be able to pay health care you can now afford. So it's always the same interest-free financing program that enables it all. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Bond. The Canada Health Act needs to be respected. The importance of Paul Martin signed renewed is strengthened and easy access to good, strong public health care is a fundamental principle and value that I think all parties should share. Unfortunately, if you can't make this tonight, you may disagree. When it gets to health care, the issue again that I come back to is housing care. We have a study that she well, the housing first study that shows that when you house people with mental health and addiction issues, you save the health care system $26,000 per person per year. If you want to know where your health care money is, it's not happening in housing. When you stabilize people's living arrangements, seniors in particular, we talked about was also other programs we're bringing forward in the, in the ward. When you stabilize people's housing, you can deal with their health issues. In fact, you drive savings into the health care budget. That's why I'm running. We know this firsthand. You've heard me say it over and over again. Cities are doing this. Vancouver's doing it brilliantly. We have gone to Vancouver and studied what we're doing it here in Toronto. We're trying. We need to amplify it, accelerate these policies. The way to get at the health care budget is to housing. Requires an urban agenda is why we need to all this why in your vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, President. Strengthening our social services is more than about building a caring society. It's about strengthening the degree in which we can build an economy. It's about making sure people are well off. And so there's a couple specific areas at the federal level I want to come to. Immigrant health services. The federal government has we see it, I hear it all the time on the doors. We should restore that funding. That's the first. The second, when we talk about public health, we need, and it came up earlier to talk about mental health. We actually need a national mental health strategy in this country and to look at suicide prevention, especially among our Indigenous and First Nations youth and their LGBTQ youth. And the third for me is I'm coming to childcare. I met with some folks recently around childcare, Martha Friendly, many of you will know, and we talked about the principles of principles on which we could build national childcare. And it's not just affordability and universality, it's not just looking at access, it's looking at flexibility, because there's so many single parents out there, and they need help with childcare overnight, not just nine to five. Those are three areas I'd like to look at. Thank you, Mr. Cressy. Aaron? Okay. Um, I live in Nevada, there's a Lake Shore area, and one of the most important issues to me is uh, congestion. Mr. Prim, uh, amazing passes. <laughs>
think you pointed out quite rightly that we used to be known for our peacekeeping abilities. Unfortunately, under Stephen Harper, it has been nothing but cut, cut, cut. You know, I've spent time living and working in West and Southern Africa, where they are, under the Harper government, closing offices. And so a voice for peace and human rights is more than peacekeepers, it's about official development assistance. But when we talk about peacekeepers, it's more than blue helmets and men in blue helmets standing in between people. It's about peacemakers and the role of women in it. This is something Norway's done really well with peacemakers in the peacekeeping movement. We can be a voice for peacekeeping and peace building and making, but the center for peace out of Ottawa, that's something our party and Paul Dewar has proposed. And it's more than just men in blue helmets. This is one of the things I like to talk about in peace. It is about the role of communities and the role of women in being part of peacekeeping and peacemaking. Thanks. Well, I think Canada blew all of our peacemaker cred a few years ago. We used to have it, it's now gone. You know, M-PESA is the satellite, because of the satellite over Africa, the M-PESA system started. All the poor Africans got cell phones, and M-PESA allowed them to transfer minutes, mobile cell phone minutes, to pay for things. So, it was using an alternate currency, cell phone minutes, for people who had no other money. And guess what? Their economies have boomed. Now, who's the guy who financed that satellite? Noah Markagoff. He provided free health care for all his people, free education for all his people. He forced you to own a house you couldn't rent, you had to buy, and he'd lend it to you interest free and forced you to buy a house. You couldn't rent tools, you had to buy it, own it, no renting in Libya. He built the greatest rock river project in history, and Canada went and murdered St. Muammar Gaddafi, one of my great heroes, a leader who never stole from his people. Now, if you believe your mainstream media, you are as dense as you sound, okay? You've been lied to, and Africa knows the truth about Muammar, and we're going to get it someday. Thank you, Mr. Gavell, I think. I didn't know that, did you? That's enough. One of the easiest things about joining the Liberal Party is looking back on the proud record of where, where they put Canada on the stage of the world. Whether it's really center on the Suez Canal crisis and, the, and the, 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 the project that won Mike Pearson his Nobel Prize, whether it's Pearson in Vietnam, whether it's Trio, the extraordinary bravery of standing up to the Americans in Chile and allowing refugees to come into the consulate and get to Canada for safekeeping many friends. It's also about Jean Chrétien. One of the proudest and most extraordinary moments as a Canadian I ever witnessed was the goodbye to Jean Chrétien down to your Canada Center when he kept Canada out of the war in Iraq. Yes. This is the You used to be able to send your kids abroad with a big belief on the back. You're a little less confident in doing that these days. And as my 16 year old heads out into the world, we need to change that. One of the ways you change it is you do what I did when I was young. I went to Nicaragua and El Salvador and Chile. I worked in building community radios around the world to give people a voice. But I also went back to El Salvador to protect the vote in that country and embrace democracy. This is what Canada does. We mediate, we moderate, we bring conversation and solutions to the world stage. But the Liberals have the most extraordinary and the proudest record on that file that I'm proud of you to speak to that history and Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. We're at the end of the questions, and now we're going to do two-minute closing statements, and we're going to reverse the order. And I'm sure Mr. Vaughn is very grateful for that. Mr. Vaughn, we're going to start with you. We'll two-minute uh, closing. Well, thank you to the Residents Association and this in the Northeast Quadrant of this riding. Thank you to my colleagues on stage, but of course, thank you to the voters, the constituents, the residents of this riding. I have the honor of serving as a local councillor, and I want the honor to serve you up in Ottawa. But the issues that we're confronting are the same ones that I spoke to you about the last two elections. We have got to get back to building great cities. Our economy depends on it. Our cities and our neighborhoods depend on it. Fundamentally, the future depends on getting to Toronto, getting this part of Toronto, getting the lessons from this part of Toronto, taken to the world stage through Ottawa. We, it's not just about building a better Canada. We have an opportunity to export the ideas and the values and the processes techniques and the programs around the world. That is what we can do as Canadians. But we need to do it up in Ottawa, and we need to do it for ourselves first. 
We need to deliver better housing, better programs for Aboriginal and rural communities. But we also need to get back into cities and deliver on transit, on cultural infrastructure, on aquatic and water infrastructure. And fundamentally, we have got to start building housing for each other again. Housing for seniors, for workers, for elderly people, for students, for faculty. We have got to find ways to deliver low income ownership as well as rent. We have to support our co ops. We have to restore the capacity in this country to care for one another by delivering shelter to one another. It's the way you drive this agenda forward. It's why I joined the Liberal Party. It's why I'm asking you to join me in this campaign to make cities matter. It's fundamental to the future of all of us. And I hope I can get your support. Thank you. Now, you'll remember I said that marijuana grows new brain cells, which explains why it's good for dementia and Alzheimer's. And of course, they're not for marijuana. I am, I'm leading the fight. And the point is, it explains why I'm so sharp and they're so dull. Get me? <laughs> now, first of all, I'm sure you're not as dumbed down as you seem to the camera, missing all the jokes. I'm sure 90% of you are party clappers, and I've offended your parties by making fun of the climate issue, okay? And I, I understand why none of the jokes worked after that. But you've got to realize, you've been lied to. How can you look at no change in temperature in 18 years and vote for people who want to give you a carbon tax, who keep talking about climate change? Hey, when it was global warming, they could say, wow, a degree is bad. But now they can't say that no more, so they changed it to anything. <laughs> What's a climb? Up or down? They don't know, but they're scared. Well, I'm trying to tell you, they wouldn't have changed it from the precision of a temperature degree of danger to the imprecision of a climb of danger, unless it was a fraud. And I bet the Green Party candidate, Adriana, whatever her name, two years ago, a hundred bucks, the temperature hadn't risen. She ain't paid yet. She's a stiff. And I'm saying these candidates won't take my hundred dollar bet either that the temperature hasn't risen. And if any of you guys got the balls, stand up too. Woo! Thank you. No balls. All right. Like that. You're done, Mr. You're done, sir. What's your hundred bucks? Relax. I've got another hundred dollars special. You guys can take it outside. We're going to do not going back here. Hey, Okay, let's laugh, Chuck. You can calm yourself and now it's start. <laughs> Don't talk climate change. Hey, come on, Chuck. Do you mind? Don't worry, it's just disrespectful. You know, the deal is, shut up, the Sir, the deal is, you respect the other candidates when I ask you to. You yield the floor, you have your turn, and it's over. We're going to listen to the slap chat now, and we're going to be quiet. Thank you. Well, thank all of you coming and the organizers and, and my fellow candidates and Gus for moderating that was not easy. <laughs> Listen, I've spent my life working on local, national, and international issues right around the country and around the world. And I've learned a lot, but I've never had more fun than I have in the last three months knocking on doors. And one of the things I hear a lot when I'm knocking on doors, and this one hurts, is when people say, and I hear it too much, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who I vote for, you're all the same. I hear that a lot, but it matters so much. Progressive politics matters. Climate change and standing up for our environment matters. Social justice matters. Working together to defeat Stephen Harper matters. It really, really matters. And this by-election for me, well, it's about continuing the work that Olivia Chow has done here and doing that by standing up for progressive issues downtown and standing up to Stephen Harper. And I know many of you, I've talked to many of you, you said I have a tough choice to make. Well, in making that choice, I hope you join me in standing with the environmental community and the First Nations by standing against climate change and the Keystone Pipeline. I hope you join me by saying yes to working together and cooperating to, Stephen, to beat Stephen Harper. And I hope you join me in understanding that progressive politics, standing on the side of justice and a progressive vision for our country, it really matters. It always has. And in Trinity Spadina, in the last election we'll ever have in Trinity Spadina, 
I hope we carry on that legacy, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you so much. Just before you go, before you go, a uh, couple of things. Uh, when it comes to the democratic process, this is where the rubber hits the road. I can't tell you how uh, uh, respectful I am of you for uh, being the audience of work tonight. We had a wide variety of uh, things being said, and some even outrageous. But remember this, outrageous things, as long as it's not saying there's fire in a traffic clear, there is one, is not a hanging offense, it's not even being kicked out offense. Abridgement of free speech is not what we're about. So the speakers kept to their kept to their time limits. There was a bit of crosstalk, but they stopped when asked. So I think the the candidates deserve a very big round of applause.